Um, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Zina Al-Sahouri. I'm a PhD student about to graduate and defending next week, actually. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that's exciting. Um, I'm doing a talk on membrane protein crystallization because a lot of my PhD had to do with that. Um, and so I work in ASU, Arizona State University uh, with Dr. Wei Lu and uh, we're part of the BioXFL uh, group. So we also do the summer internship if you're interested in, in doing that in our lab, we've done that before. So um, yeah. I'll try to complement the other talks by focusing more on the protein aspects um, rather than um, you know the crystallization uh, stuff you've already kind of been introduced to. And then um, a lot of the techniques we use are in LCP, which will be the next talk. So I'll focus more on preparing the proteins. Okay, so why do we even care about membrane proteins? I think you've probably heard about this if you've looked into membrane proteins. They're um, very well-known drug targets. Um, they're involved in pretty much every kind of signaling uh, you can imagine in the body. Um, and so that's why about 60% of the drugs on the market will target them. Um, and if we solve their structure, that means we're able to kind of understand how they work, the structure function uh, relationships, um, basically the mechanisms. And also, if we know the 3D structure of them, then we might, medicinal chemists might be able to design um, better binding drugs that will give, um, that will work better and give us less side effects. So they're kind of really crucial to understand. Um, and there are all sorts of different classes within that. Some of them are embedded in the membranes. Some of them are just associated with the membranes. Um, and most of the, what I'm going to talk about is basically how we deal with any protein that when we lyse the cells, it will be um, associated with the membrane and we have to extract it out of that. Um, so yeah, this I mentioned, um, if we know them more and understand them better, we have better drugs uh, to treat all sorts of things. Um, as opposed to soluble proteins, um, which already can be hard to crystallize, we have added kind of challenges when we work with membrane proteins. Um, since they are pretty hydro hydrophobic um, as they sit in the membranes, um, we have some issues. Uh, for example, we have to extract them out of the um, membranes using detergents, which means those proteins will be unhappy if they're out of their native environment. So there are things um, we kind of need to consider when we're working with them. Um, well, also they have usually low expression. So there's a lot of work that goes into optimizing um, the, the proteins, what they look like um, in terms of the constructs, as well as all the different uh, processes that we will have to go through. So I'll go into that in a minute. Uh, also, again, they're pretty unstable. So uh, we have to deal with that with, um, and taking a lot of care with decreasing temperatures and adding a lot of things to kind of stabilize them in solution. Um, and there is kind of uh, some issues with growing well diffracting crystals um, if they have a lot of flexible regions. So we can tackle all these issues um, in the slides that I will mention now. Um, this is kind of an overview of the process. Um, the first thing you want to do, of course, identify what is the membrane protein uh, you want to work with, and then think about how you're going to uh, optimize each step. So first of all, the expression part, you will want to um, have a lot of ideas of construct design. So I'll go into that, but basically you can't just take the wild type protein oftentimes and just express it, luckily have a lot of protein and then move forward and crystallize it. That usually, it's usually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, so you have to do construct design. Um, you have to sometimes screen different hosts, especially if you have a protein from a eukaryotic um, um, cell. So if it's, especially if it's a human membrane protein, that's even worse because um, you need to have specific considerations. Um, and then of course, after you selected what system of expression, you have to do screening of different parameters like temperatures and time and things like that, additives. Um, the next step is after you've expressed it, you're, you want to extract it from the membrane and solubilize it. Because when you spin down those cells and lyse them, it's going to be in the pellet. So it's not in the solution. You will need to use specific detergents. Um, 
and try to see which ones give you the most protein out of the membranes. Um, and there are other methods also with membrane mimetics um, to stabilize the protein. Purification, that's probably the most similar to other proteins. You'll use um, um, immobilized uh, metal ion chromatography or um, using nickel NTA or talon um, and size exclusion chromatography and, and or other steps. But these are kind of typical to other proteins uh, as well. And then sometimes you have to do pre-crystallization screening to see um, if the protein is stable enough to, morph, to move forward with the crystallization steps, which I won't go too much into um, as, as, as will be covered soon. Um, so for construct design, um, the, first, the first bullet point is again, a little bit similar to, to soluble proteins. You'll probably need to add some kind of purification uh, tag. So his tag, uh, flag tag also can be used for different assays to measure expression levels and, and things like that. Um, I've seen most, most of the time with membrane proteins, people try to add eight to 10 histidine residues rather than um, six or something like that for some soluble proteins. Um, I'm not sure how much, uh, it's probably because uh, you have a micelle, so you want it to be kind of a little bit more accessible. So that's one thing uh, you can try to screen either eight or, or 10. Um, other things, typically use is um, if you have flexible or disordered regions in the protein, they can be, and they're not super uh, crucial to seeing the structure, you might want to truncate them um, and get rid of them. That way you have better, uh, better stability for the protein and better luck with crystallization. As Sarah mentioned, um, you know, you, you'll have kind of issues with uh, crystallizing if you have too many flexible regions. Um, there are also ways you can add stabilizing mutations based on um, the protein. So for example, if it's a receptor and you want to lock it into one conformation, like an active versus inactive, you might want to mutate it um, after you do the literature search and see uh, what people have done with similar proteins. Um, for fusion proteins, sometimes uh, with certain receptors like G protein coupled receptors, um, what people do, I'll show in the next, or I'll just show in the next slide. Um, so this is what's called a snake plot. And you have the N terminus of the protein is on this side. And each of these bundles represents the, uh, he the helices of the protein um, that span the membrane. Uh, what, what a lot of people do is um, first you look at all these flexible long loops and think, okay, are they, ordered, not ordered, will they make my life easy or hard? Probably it will be good to kind of screen a few options. For example, you have uh, one construct that contains everything, wild type, you know, your control. Um, one of them might truncate 5, 10, 15, 20 um, amino acids from the N terminus. One would do the same with the C terminus. Um, and then you can also truncate the intracellular loop three, which is usually um, is very uh, kind of flexible. So you might truncate it um, and then put in a fusion uh, protein. And these are usually uh, soluble proteins that are pretty well ordered um, that kind of help the protein um, be more stable and also uh, help with crystal contacts when you get to the crystallization point. Um, so there is kind of specifically with GPCRs, it's a little bit, um, they're, they're kind of never crystallized uh, as a wild type unless, well, specifically crystallized, it's never the wild type. Um, and so you have to do a lot of modifications. Um, other things, uh, a signal peptide, uh, you might put in um, in the beginning that uh, in, the, in the example of GPCRs, it will make sure your protein is shuttled from the ER all the way to the membranes. So it will be uh, found in the membranes and not kind of crash out or get stuck somewhere in, in the process. And then co uh, codon optimization, after you pick which expression system you want to use, um, you might uh, have to send in um, to a specific company and, and have them codon optimize if, if it's being expressed by a different organism than the native organism for the protein. For example, if you're using a human protein and you want to express it in insect cells, the, 
the codons used for amino acids will be different um, in how likely they are to be used by the insect cells. So it will kind of make sure your protein gets more expressed by those, um, by those organisms. Um, okay, so let's talk about expression systems. Obviously, most simple, you probably know or have used it, E. coli, um, and then a yeast. There's other ones like Leishmania um, cells that are kind of interesting to use as well. Um, I would say most is insect cells for membrane proteins and uh, I guess mammalian cells here. So there's a lot of things you have to consider here uh, when you're choosing which expression system. If the membrane protein is already kind of a simple, um, you know, bacterial protein or something like that, you don't really have a reason probably to go to like mammalian cells to express it because it just doesn't make sense. Um, probably E. coli would have all the machinery you need uh, to express it successfully. So, you know, it depends on what is the protein, what is its source. Um, for, for us, we always think about human proteins because these are the ones we'll probably want to solve the structure of and want, you know, drugs for. So uh, we'll go for um, insect cells because they're kind of in between mammalian and E. coli. And uh, they're sophisticated enough to kind of give us functioning and high quality protein. Um, but sometimes you're just gonna have to go to mammalian cells. So um, there's a table here that kind of summarizes the differences. Um, it's usually, you know, in your lab, Sometimes this decision is not yours because it depends on what you have access to. For example, for um, E. coli and yeast, it's lower cost, it's easier to use. Um, you know, they say there is, the expression levels are high and high to moderate, but this really depends on the protein. You know? um, for example, like I said, if it's, a, if it's a human membrane protein, you might maybe have higher or moderate expression levels, but it'll be all kind of aggregated and not properly folded and, and things like that. So there is a lot of kind of things that might be out of your hand and depends on what you have access to. Um, again, it's probably a good idea to start with insects. And then if you, if you already have that set up and if you have issues, you might try mammalian cells. Um, the last thing here is uh, post-translational modifications. They might be really important for your protein to function properly. So these three pretty much, I mean, E. coli doesn't do much, doesn't have proper machinery uh, for like complex human um, uh, membrane proteins. Yeast and insect might have more um, and the most obviously will be mammalian because it's similar to the human, um, to the human um, receptor and the system that expresses it. So, it's kind of something you might keep in mind if it's if it's uh, important for your protein. Um, so you express your protein, you have that, um, you have those cells, you spin them down and you have the cell pellet. The next step is how are you going to lyse them? Um, and what else do you need to do? Because with soluble proteins, you know, it'll be in the solution and you just move forward with that and purify it, right? Um, for lysis, um, it depends on the cell line that you used and, and the type of expression system. Mammalian insect cells um, are, are lysed easier because uh, they don't have the cell wall. So usually you can use a hypotonic solution. So the cells will swell up and then you can still use something like Down's homogenization or a microfluidizer sometimes also. Um, and these will make sure everything is lysed properly and you don't have any kind of uh, uneven um, lysing in, in, your, um, in your cells. For bacterial yeast cells, it, you'll probably need um, much, much more kind of uh, standard mechanical forces uh, like microfluidizer and um, sonicator, things like that. Um, for membrane proteins, since they are a little bit less stable, um, you might you want to make sure it is done at a cooler temperature because if you heat up the solution, um, you know, it will crash out and aggregate. So it's a really bad idea. Um, and protease inhibitors, of course, you want to add that to protect your protein. Um, you use a, an ultra centrifuge. And then you can do other steps to kind of wash out the membranes because once you get rid of the soluble stuff, there might be still some kind of associated uh, proteins to the membrane. 
So you can use a hypertonic solution and do another round of down homogenization or something like that and wash off um, all these other proteins. And then at the end of the day, you'll end up with your protein uh, embedded in the membranes, hopefully clean and good to go. Now, this is probably the biggest difference, um, you know, than soluble proteins. Obviously, you need to use detergents to extract those proteins from the membrane. So to do that, um, you'll use, you'll try to use a lot of detergents uh, and screen and see which one works better for your protein. Um, so there's a lot of types. Ionic ones are usually a little bit harsher. So you can try to do um, non-ionic ones and screen them. Um, and also is what are ionic ones? And um, it, it depends, you know, it varies by protein. Each protein will like and, and be more sufficiently extracted by one type versus the other. Um, and there are other things you can change like concentration of the detergent, uh, duration of solubilization and the temperature. Um, also for bacterial proteins, and if you use E. coli, um, they might be expressed in the outer membrane. So there's a special detergent you can use called Sarcosyl, and it will um, it will first solubilize the inner membranes, uh, and you can separate them from the outer membranes and do the extraction from there. Um, this is an example of how you might think about setting up this screening. You have all of your detergents. Um, you want the CMC, which is the critical um, micellar concentration. This is the concentration where you start having micelles versus then versus the just the detergent molecules floating in the solution. Um, so it recommends to you what what kind of concentration to use for the solubilization step uh, for each one, and then um, you, when you do the actual purification, you're going to have to decrease that um, so it's not super high. Um, so this is just like an example you can use to uh, set up and figure out uh, which ones you want, which detergent will work best. Um, this is another way to show how you might screen them. Um, these are three different detergents. You can have uh, three different durations for solubilization. Some, some proteins might be solubilized in two hours. Some of them you might have to do overnight if, you know, they're not... Um, if the detergent you know, has a hard time extracting them, you can try different temperatures and different concentrations. And then um, you would, after all of this, you would spin them down and then um, the soluble fraction you can load on gels and uh, Western blot and figure out which ones give you the best results. So for example, in this case, OG and NG didn't give as well results as, um, as, my, as the other uh, detergents. So for the purification part, it's kind of straightforward. Like I mentioned, you know, you use iMac. Um, you might prolong the binding time. Um, some people do it just in case with memory proteins because um, you, like usually instead of just running it on a standard column, you might just add the uh, resin directly to your protein and rotate them for a specific amount of time to make sure they bind well. Um, in case there is less accessibility due to the uh, micelles. And then you might do other things like size exclusion, ion exchange, just depends on your protein and, and if you have pure enough sample. Um, you have to make sure detergent is added throughout all of uh, these steps to every buffer and then probably need to do at four degrees Celsius to make sure um, nothing crashes out. Yeah, so we talked about all of this, but a lot of times uh, you see, you know, the positive control, this is what I want. Um, this protein would elute around, you know, 4.2 minutes um, on this column. And so this is what I want. This is the positive control, but this is what I get. And it's like, okay, what do I do from here? Um, there's so I'll also say uh, for this column, this is the void volume. So usually you, anything that doesn't go through the column will elute here. And a lot of times with memory proteins, you'll have aggregates. So even though we took care of uh, choosing a really good detergent, all of that, we might still have issues with the protein crashing out or just having, you know, maybe not folded properly or things like this. Um, so it will aggregate. So yeah. This, at this point, you just have to kind of go back to the drawing board and think about, you know, the previous steps with construct design. Are there other constructs I might have missed? 
Um, do I need to switch to a different expression host? Um, do I need to change the time, um, you know, of, you know, 24 hours versus 48 hours of, of expressing the protein or the temperatures? Um, for I know for E. coli, a lot of people like to decrease the temperatures um, during expression, but you know that could be something you have to screen because each protein will be different. And then again, detergents, do you need to switch to a different detergent um, if, and make sure all your purification steps were done uh, properly and are optimized? And it's really important to have really good controls because you never know what has gone wrong at this point. Um, I've heard of people saying, you know, the even though they ordered a new bottle of detergent, there was issues with the quality control, and so nothing worked. So when you when you have a control, you know that you know it's none of the materials. Um, but that's why membrane protein crystallization is hard because you have to go through all of these different steps um, for a long time and screen everything. Other considerations, if you have a receptor like a GPCR, um, you definitely need a really high affinity ligand. And in fact, you probably need to screen them as well um, because you want to lock the protein into one conformation and not, you know, some are activated, some are not. And then the crystals, or if you even get crystals, they'll be kind of a mess. Um, and you won't have a really good time, you know, getting good data. Um, so ligands have to be added at every step, you know, early on, probably during solubilization. Um, tags, um, if you have histags and other things you don't want in the crystals, you will add protease sites and you can add uh, proteases like TEV and other ones that you can cleave them off before. Um, and then there are other little tricks that you wouldn't kind of know until you ask someone who's worked with them. Um, like, you know, you think I just concentrate the protein, uh, I just throw it into those filters um, and put it in the centrifuge, but there is like little things, for example, the detergent is in the micelles, so you have to take into account that, uh, it's probably bigger, you need to use a bigger cutoff for the kilodaltons than it, just the protein size, because um, the, the micelles will, will add size to it. And then um, we usually do that uh, concentration at lower speeds, like 2000 G, not more. Whereas with memory, with soluble proteins, you probably go way higher than that. So it's, it's probably good at every step if you've never worked with them or you don't know someone who did to double check the literature or ask someone, um, you know, email them or ask anyone who has published a paper or something um, about some of these little tricks. Um, things to do pre-crystallization uh, at this point, is to make sure the protein is stable enough so it doesn't like crash out after one day in the fridge or something like that. Um, probably the most accessible way is to use size exclusion chromatography. So um, like I showed, um, you want it to be homogeneous, not, not a lot of aggregation. In fact, you know, like the question about purity, you want as little as possible you want 100% pure. So you can, you can do a study where you run the protein every day for you know five, seven days, whatever, and see if that changes dramatically or not um, and figure out what you might do about it because you don't want to set up crystallization and then um, have issues because of that. Um, you can do dynamic light scattering, uh, which will show you kind of the what's in, the dimensions of what's in the solution and how homogeneous it is and stable. So it will show you if you have um, empty micelles, uh, the protein in the micelles or just aggregates. And there are thermal stability assays, especially in LCP um, that you could do to kind of determine the stability of different proteins or proteins with different ligands and, and make sure you pick the one that is most stable to move forward with. And finally, crystallization, um, kind of things that were discussed or will be discussed at this point. Um, you, the only difference is it's in detergent and then um, probably a little bit harder than soluble proteins, but LCP helps a lot, which will be the next talk. So I won't say much about that, um, but yeah, that's the crystallization part is probably the most similar to, um, except the LCP is the most similar to other things, uh, other proteins.
So I'll stop here because I probably went overboard uh, <laughs> and I'll take any questions um, at this point.